All right, uh, today uh, we're going to talk about accelerating Linux boot time, techniques and strategies for optimizing uh, performance. And this is me, Ed Chong. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for three years doing performance and engineering. Um, similar to Ed, I, I'm Eric Curtin. I've um, been at Red Hat um, around three years. Um, I work um, in the automotive program. I do all sorts of things, I guess. Uh, and I'm uh, Brian Masney. I've been at Red <laughs> <laughs> and I've been at <laughs> and I've been at uh, Red Hat about uh, four and a half years, and I uh, work on the automotive kernel. All right. Uh, first up, uh, this has been a pretty big collaborative effort for uh, an automotive team to be able to uh, do improve the boot time. Uh, that said, these are shout out to the contributors of boot time. It's quite a big list, so I won't read, read, read off of it. Uh, so first item is, what is Red Hat in Vehicle OS? Uh, it is essentially rel for cars, but with the big difference that uh, we have automotive safety certification for it, and this enables Linux to be used for all parts of the car. Uh, currently, Linux is mainly used for the in uh, vehicle entertainment system, so the touch screen. Uh, and the other big difference is we're not delivering a pre-built image, but we're delivering all the tools and components for a partner to build their own image. Uh, so why speed up boot time? So imagine your computer booting up. If you try to go into the car, would you want to wait this, and you try to turn on the car, you try to go reverse, and you have to wait for your computer to boot up. This is why boot time kind of matters in an automotive sense. But for RHEL, traditionally, we run on servers. And servers, you can take forever to boot up. They never get shut down. So that's not an issue. But for cars, uh, there's a power constraint and also a safety aspect. If I want to reverse quickly, I want that camera to be up. Uh, and which is what these three items are, is uh, we need them up around two seconds. So the safety belt chime, the gear selector, and the rear view camera. Uh, observability and me measurements. Uh, the first way, the, in order to optimize, you first have to be able to measure. Uh, that's what we'll talk about. And how do we measure boot time? So some of the challenges measuring boot time is this is pretty much uncharted territory for us, uh, especially in the early system startup. Uh, there's really no tooling or resources for it. So we had to come up with the, the boot time uh, measurement techniques uh, from scratch. Uh, so, and then. The other thing that makes it hard is the measurement technique must be uh, hardware agnostic. Uh, we're going to run on many different platforms, and we can't have a custom solution for every hardware platform we run on to be able to measure boot time. And unlike servers, uh, ARM platforms are pretty inflexible, and every ARM platform is pretty different from each other. So we can't like swap out a part if we want to make it go faster. So we have to work with what we have. And then each, uh, each board, uh, each hardware platform has their own uh, kernel modules, their own services that all have significant impact on boot time. And then for the tooling, uh, we end up using three main tools, SystemD Analyze. Uh, it's already built in to SystemD. It does a pretty good job of uh, having, uh, telling you where the, where, how the Linux boot time is, uh, any services that are running too slowly, it'll tell you that. The other thing is using dmessage and journal logs. Uh, we key in on specific log message for a uh, specific uh, key metric. So when does SE Linux uh, start? When, does it, when is it loaded? When is the first service starting? And then the last one is the CNT VCD counter that is provided by the ARM processor. It's a register that keeps counting up for pretty much uptime for the ARM processor. And this allows us to measure any time prior to Linux starting. Uh, and then with that, we have an automation that we had to do to take all these three uh, outputs and combine them into something usable for us, and also uh, provide visualization so that we can easily visualize where the bottlenecks are. Uh, next step, uh, so measurement technique. So like before I said, system D analyze uh, is for the Linux side of things. Uh, it measures the kernel, the NIT RAM S, and user space. And we also use the D message and journal logs for the same, uh, for the same, another view 
into the system. Uh, so the one thing we can't measure is the kernel, what we call the kernel pre-timer. So when Linux starts, it takes a little bit of time for the timer to start. So what this manifests itself is when you look at a D message log, you see a ton of entries that all start at zero. This is what we're calling the kernel pre-timer. So we can't actually measure that within Linux. So uh, we measure that within Linux. Uh, the other item is the firmware time. This is all hardware dependent. We include, for firmware time, we include the bootloader, any hardware initializations, all that I'm lumping in as calling this firmware. And to measure this, uh, Eric Chanaday uh, created these uh, CNTVCD kernel patches that are outer tree kernel patches, but it allows adds additional logging so that we can see what time when the kernel starts, how long the system has been up. Uh, and this allows us to measure everything before the kernel. Uh, and then another next step up is uh, Eric also made a uh, user space RPM package that can install on Linux user space and read that CNTVCD register. And with that, we can figure out uh, what, let's, I think we use basic target, and we take what is in the CMTVC counter, subtract it what we see in the journal logs, and then that gives us what this entire piece here of the firmware and pre-kernel time, we have one number. So unfortunately, there's not granular enough to know how much the kernel pre-timer is, so we still need the out of tree patches, but we only need it for any, only need to run it for any firmware changes. So if there's no firmware changes, we can use the same number and then subtract it off to find this kernel pre-timer. And then uh, the other one, also one hiccup that we found with the CNTVCT is different platforms treat it differently. So when you do a reboot, some platforms don't actually reset the counter, so you have to hard reset the, uh, the board. All right, uh, so for overall boot time optimization overview, uh, this is a view of before we started any major optimizations. I think we had a couple minor ones, but this is pretty uh, major optimization. So we were booting at 18.5 seconds for everything. And you can see that the pre-timer on the left of the kernel is almost half the kernel time. Afterwards, uh, we had an overall reduction of 14 seconds with the total boot time of being 4.8 seconds. And then here is the full list of numbers, and you can see uh, we had uh, big reductions across the board. And if you look at the pre-timer, it went from 720 milliseconds to 101 milliseconds. So prior to this, we didn't even know it existed, and then we found out it was 720, and now we pretty much got it down by almost 90%. Uh, next piece, optimizations and techniques to make for faster boot. Uh, so can we boot a system within two seconds? Uh, and like all answers, it depends. Uh, so taking the previous uh, measurements with where we have 4.8 seconds for a complete booted system, uh, the thing is, what do we define a booted system? Like, sure, technically, it takes 4.8 seconds for the Linux for Linux to boot, but I but we actually only care about being able to start the first application. So in this case, it's 790 milliseconds, and for example, we want to start this rear view camera application. So at 790 milliseconds, we can start this rear view camera application, and we're taking that as the key metric, but this doesn't include any time of how long it takes for the display to initialize and all that for the application to run. But uh, so with that said, 790 milliseconds, is our job done? Uh, nope, unfortunately, there's still that firmware time, and that varies from platform to platform. Uh, and with that said, uh, the time in the Linux time also varies from platform to platform, depending if it's faster or slower. And yeah, different hardware, different performances, and also different services that they have, different kernel modules that all impact our boot time. So what could we do? What can we do? Uh, we can simplify the components. So RHEL is mainly a server operating system. So there's a lot of things that aren't uh, that are very generic and aren't uh, that isn't suitable for uh, automotive use. So we kind of strip that down, uh, simplify things, and then try to make it more focused so that we can reach these boot time metrics faster. And another thing is do more at build time of the OS rather than at boot time. I think for, this kind of links to the previous talk. So instead of generating the system D files on boot on boot time, we can gener generate at build time just to save some time. Uh, the other thing is. Per device optimization. So 
we're going to have to work with the part with the hardware vendors to be able to optimize their hardware a little bit and uh, work with them to optimize their services and kernel modules to help them uh, bring down the time. And then the other thing is uh, we can't do everything at once, so we have to prioritize critical features. So in this case, we'll let's say we're going to prioritize the rear view camera first and then shift stuff that isn't so critical to the right a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna go over some of the uh, kernel optimization, kind of some of the big things that we did, it helped a, a bit. Um, so first slide's just a lot of just basic things of like we pruned all the unnecessary kernel, kernel configurations we didn't need. Um, move as much functionality, so there's some kernel functionality that, um, that you might le need later on, but you don't actually need it built into the kernel, so you can move it as a module that way you can initialize it later on in the boot. Um, quiet your uh, kernel logs, or if you run with the newer upstream RT patch set that has the print K threaded console support. So like if you're writing to the UART, it's going to, all those log messages are gonna slow down your boot on there. Um, the kernel parameter, the kernel has a, a nit call debug um, command line parameter that you can use to just see how long all the different init calls take. Um, there's also like trace point that you can use, and I just have a link there to um, how you can enable those trace points on boot up. Um, and also be aware if you have a FIPS enabled kernel, then there's like those crypto self tests that need to be part of FIPS. Like that can add one 200 milliseconds to your overall boot. Um, an another big hitter was in your init RAM FS, put no kernel modules there. Um, so like the top D message has. You know, init runs about at a quarter second, and then within our init RAM FS, it was initializing the virtual storage at about three quarters of a second. Whereas if we, when we set the storage drivers we needed to be built in, um, you know, the init still runs approximately at a quarter second, but the storage just initializes much faster. Um, and I linked, if anyone's interested in more details about like your size versus like the speed constraints, like on that merge request at the bottom there has like all the, has some more details. Um, it di really didn't make our kernel that much bigger for like three or four targets. Um, compression is also another thing. So like if, if your kernel's small enough and your storage is fast enough, you can actually get faster boot times with booting an uncompressed kernel. So like on one of our targets with booting with an uncompressed kernel, we were saving about 100 milliseconds. Um, same with your init RAM FS. Although we had like a combined, on one target, we have a combined init RAM FS and kernel, and we had space constraints. So we're actually LZ4 compressing the uh, init RAM FS. Um, and then on the root file system, we just use um, Zstead uh, compression instead of XZ. Um, and so where we're using the, the real time kernel, one of the really, another one of the big performance hits that we saw was the Lynx kernel has something called read copy update. And there's a, there's a thing, it's called an RCU barrier. And it basically just says stop and just make all that stuff process and get done. Well, RCU on a real time system, you don't want the CPU for one processor to affect another processor on there. So it, it takes longer to do that. Um, so we have no real-time guarantees on boot up with the system. So what we actually do is we run it in on boot up with an RCU expedited mode. So it goes super fast. And then once the system's fu fully booted, we have a system D unit come in and run and just says, put it back to normal mode. Um, that way, then you'll get the nice real-time guarantees and the faster um, boot there. So this merge request here also links to a merge request from Alex Larson where um, it has a system D unit and everything there. Um, another delay that we encountered, it was, um, it was freeing the kernel memory. And that was also another case where RCU came in and was involved. And so like it was sometimes 100 milliseconds or more on one of our target platforms. Um, and separately, there's Eric Chanoday 
tracked this down. There was someone from Huawei, like a few weeks before, also tracked this down and submitted a patch upstream um, that just changed it to where it just runs like in a work queue in the background. Um, so with that, and it's now in um, 6.9 kernel, and then with that patch, you don't have that 100 milliseconds delay anymore. Um, so Ed was talking about the, the pre-timer initialization. So like on one of our boards with 36 gig of RAM, it took like 700 milliseconds to initialize that. So like when you run systemd analyze, that, was, that number was not being um, reported. There's several workarounds you could do with that. Um, so in ARM64, we don't have to go into the details of it, but there's a kernel parameter called RO data, and you can boot with RO data equals on. However, it mitigates a security hardening measure. Um, another alternative is that you can hot plug the system memory. So like you could boot with four gig of RAM, get your critical services up, and then you can um, add, add your, the rest of your system memory later on. Um, but there's actually in 6.10, there's a patch series that goes through engineers at Red Hat, worked with engineers at ARM, and then that's all fixed now. So like I know on some of the bigger servers, like the Ampere servers, you'll see like two seconds or more um, uh, memory speed up with that. And another speed up is related to, you can actually defer, so you can have this, the kernel initialize, boot with pre-timer with a subset of the memory, and then once the timer's initialized and the CPUs are all initialized, it can then bring the rest of the memory up in parallel. Um, so it'll shift, um, you know, with it doing it parallel, it'll shift it like from 230 milliseconds pre-timer to 70 milliseconds post-timer. Um, Eric digging in all this memory stuff, he also found there's some other fix-ups on there that we can do. So basically it reduced it from 230 milliseconds to 30 milliseconds. Um, and Another optimization that we, we'd worked on, it was with the, the storage driver. So like there's the UFS and the firmware. So the firmware needs to bring up the storage controller to, to boot the system. Well, Linux would come back in and reinitialize um, the board, the storage controller because it didn't know what state that the, um, it was in. So you can actually now with the, at least on this one Qualcomm one, it can check to see, is this currently in the, they refer to it as the gear, is this in the right gear, like the right speed that we need it to be? And if it is, then we could just skip initializing it. Um, and separately, Andrew Helaney, he was working on a, there's the network adapter, um, it was like with, with the Phi, programming the Phi. It was a, um, or it was again, it would just, occur a couple times on there. We don't need to go into the details on it, but that's just another way on there. And kind of the main point is if like, from the kernel perspective, just because the drivers are there, you really should look at for the platform that you're, lo that you're working on and go into detail about like, just to see what's spending some of the time on there. Because just, just for a couple platforms we were looking at, we found quite a bit of optimizations. And quite a bit, and also some of these optimizations were generic across all ARM64. Um, yes, yeah, so this brings us to inner MFS optimization. You might, you guys might have seen this in the earlier slides, but um, at the highest level, uh, we split the boot sequence into the early kernel space initialization, and then the first Linux user space um, we have access to is um, the inner MFS, which does some early um, user space tasks. And then we switch root into the final uh, root file system. Um, we don't even have a section dedicated to root FS optimization. Um, that's because this talk, in my opinion, it, it scratches the surface of the stuff we've looked into. So. I think if we get time for Q&A, I, I encourage any, anyone, if you're interested in a certain aspect of boot optimization and have a question, there's a decent chance we explored it and 
there's also a decent chance we optimize for it. Um, we can't fit everything in the slides. But um, so yeah, DNet Ramifest is the first um, early Linux user space you get access to. So, so what we did, um, first we kind of took a top-down approach and we started plucking off some systemd services that we knew we definitely didn't need. <laughs> and then, um, then we wrote like three uh, init systems from scratch. Um, so <laughs> if you're ever interested in learning this stuff, um, I actually highly recommend doing that. It's, it's a great exercise. You'll get something up and running in, um, in a matter of hours, and um, you'll, you'll really learn what's the minimal you need to um, start um, a Linux user space, basically. Um, so yeah, we took the top-down approach, and then we said, let's take a bottom-up approach. <laughs> so we took literally just the system D binary and just um, added the minimal amount of system D unit files or dot service files that we needed. Um, so now in our init RAMFS, we have system D. <laughs> I'm kind of contradicting what Brian says a little bit. He said, but no kernel modules in our init RAMFS. And that's true. If, if, if speed is of the utmost importance, that's true. But we leave this service file in case you want to include kernel modules for testing reasons or or maybe um, it's a community board or et cetera. Um, we have another service file, mount sysroot, that basically reads k-args and uh, mounts the correct partition that, um, for the root file system. Uh, we have OS3 prepare root, which is something I, I tend to describe as kind of like user space bootloader. So it picks the correct version of the user space you want to um, you want to switch root into, and it sets, some, sets up ComposeFS and all sorts of other things. Um, we have in it our D cleanup that's, a, that's built into system D. That's strictly not needed, but what it does is it, it goes around, and just, just in case um, there's um, processes that hasn't, haven't died yet, um, it'll go around killing them all. And then we have um, in it our D switch root, which switches you into the root file system. Um, yeah, so the, the one on the left, it's um, that in a RAMFS took 500 milliseconds to, um, to complete that part of the boot sequence. That was already optimized, even though it says pre-optimization. Yeah, and then we took that bottom-up approach I just discussed and, and limited to just um, those five service files, basically. So we went from roughly... Um, half a second to um, approximately 125 milliseconds. Um, we actually did similar in the root FS. We, we trimmed a lot of the system D um, Unix, units, et cetera. Sorry, it's not on the slides though. Um, so, Brian already covered this already. But yeah, th this is just, um, this is just a couple of different ways of um, loading kern kernel modules. Um, if, if you don't need performance, you just need to start a certain kernel module at some point, please use U UDEV. Uh, UDEV has a database and it knows how to start things. It knows how to query your hardware to start the correct thing. So please, if, if performance isn't really an issue, performance fine, please use that. Um, if that's not good enough, um, use systemd modules load in the root FS. So systemd modules load, you can like create a text file or, or, or list out a lot of kernel modules in your um, kernel command line. Um, that's very useful for us, especially in Rivas, because we actually build per board. So if you know your board has a certain hardware configuration, you, you can say, okay, you know, um, load these X amount of drivers, and you get a performance boost there because UDEV doesn't have to figure out what what hardware you're running on. It's it's literally listed in like a text file. Um, and if that's not fast enough, uh, do the same thing, but do it in the init RD. The init RD has a bit of a cost because it kind of copies um, like a tarball. Well, it's a CPIO archive around a memory a couple of times, so there's a little performance hit. 
but you can do that as well. And if that's not fast enough, the absolute fastest way, which Brian discussed a couple of slides ago, was um, just just build the, the kernel module directly into the kernel. Um, don't have it as a module at all. Um, oh yeah, and another thing you can do is, um, yeah, UDEV has these configuration files and it's, it has these rules and it kind of tells UDEV what to do. But um, as described earlier, um, like Rivas is like a fork of rail. So we, um, we inherit a lot of rules that come from the enterprise space about, about things we basically, we don't, we don't have to worry about because they, they don't really apply to automotive. So trim down those rules as much as you can. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. Um, yeah, so this, this is a graphical um, representation of the optimization work. Um, I used this for an init RD optimization um, presentation I, get, I gave before. So yeah, I referenced that in earlier slides. We went from like 500 milliseconds to 125. Um, milliseconds. Um, what's interesting, sometimes I like to look back at where we came from. So Fedora is the most featureful version of our operating system. And when you consider Fedora, it's like 2.2 seconds in that case. Uh, to see us down at like 125 milliseconds, I think that's, that's pretty cool. And the, sa and the same with the kernel, like the Fedora kernel like boots in one second. And now we're like booting in 250 sec 50 milliseconds. Um, we're like a Ferrari. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> um, and the same for the root FS. Um, I'm going to hand you back over to Ed. Uh, so some of the next steps we're going to explore is reducing the size of the SE Linux policy. Uh, as we said before, this is the SE Linux policies from RHEL. So we, there's a lot of stuff that we don't need. So getting a more tailored uh, SE Linux policy for it will help us improve boot time by making the file size smaller. Uh, and the other thing is exploring early networking. So we mainly focused on the root FS and init RAM FS, the user space, not so much. So we're starting to explore that. And the first thing is replacing a network manager with NM, NM state and to see if we can get the early networking up even early, get networking up even earlier. Uh, the other item is a dev desk populate script that Eric Curtin wrote. And the idea is to replace UDEV for creating sim links in uh, dev this by part label and by part UUID. This should speed it up quite, uh, speed it up quite a bit. And from the performance specific sides, uh, it's expanding to measuring more platforms. Uh, and then the other one is extending the boot analysis tools to continuously test nightly releases. So currently, you can install it on a system. It'll collect uh, the results when we ask for it, but the uh, key thing is when we make the changes, we want to make sure, and we get the improvements, we want to make sure we keep those improvements. And the only way to do that is continuously monitor it on a nightly basis. And the other thing is uh, it's boot time analysis tools open source. So if you could con contribute to it, and you can, should be able to easily run it on your mach own machine to see how it's booting. And any questions? So for the uh, optimizations you did for the kernel, is that just for the Ribos kernel or Red Hat's kernel or um, any, any kernel upstream? Um, it's all, all across the board. So there's optimizations that's done in the, in the upstream kernel. So some of those benefits are going to go into like Android and Chrome OS, um, RHEL, Ribos. Uh, some of the optimizations are Ribos specific, some are RHEL specific, but there's a fair bit of boot speed work that's been done um, that's for all ARM64 platforms. Um, well, there we go. Uh, with the, that's so loud. The, the in RAM FS, um, with you building the storage modules in, can you briefly explain? I, I, I kind of caught it, but it might be good to call out explicitly why you need an NRMFS if you can load from the that's disk a, already. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first of all, one thing that 
one thing that I, I think is really cool when you put storage modules directly into the kernel, um, the storage starts spinning up before you even get to uh, the first Linux user space, which is the init RAMFS, which that's where a lot of the performance increase comes, which I think is great. Um, this is a conversation I've had with systemd guys as well, actually. Um, the main reason is is some of the some of the tooling we use, um, like OS3 and Compose FS, and a couple of other things which we may use in future. Um, they're just designed with the concept of having a temporary initial file system and switch routing into the next one, and um, you know we'd have to we'd have to change the world just for Rivos to do that, and you know that's hard. But, but theoretically, yeah, you can just boot straight into a root FS and um, you could save maybe 50, 100 more milliseconds or something. Yeah, could be done. I want to add to that. So there's, it also depends on your, the board that you're booting. So sometimes, like, you'll, you'll have the kernel boot load every, all the module, all the drivers in parallel. And by the time it goes to load the init, the... It had, the storage hasn't settled yet, so it actually can't do that. So you'd have to actually boot the kernel with root weight. Um, whereas if you have the init RAM FS, when it gets to the point of doing the init, it has that code. It can start booting that, like right now immediately. And then it can start doing like the OS tree prep um, and the other stages in parallel memory. Meanwhile, your storage in the background is still settling. And then by the time it gets some of its prep stuffs done, then it's ready and it can just jump right over to that. So one thing that Linux is Linux has always been good at is deprecating old stuff, right? We always have our bleeding edge. And in the process of doing what you guys did, did you find or identify any old clutters that were there that shouldn't have been there and gave you a big boost? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that we cleaned up, like, and we didn't cover a lot of that in the talk. Like, when you asked that question, the first thing that sprung to mind is um, etc fstab. That's kind of a little bit legacy in the way that that works in rel right now. Is there's basically a system D generator that um, converts that etc fstab into like system D mount files. So there's a bunch of stuff we didn't cover, but we're getting rid of that and just putting the dot mount files in directly. Um, and you get a s speed up there. Um, I'm trying to think of others. There's, there's loads of stuff like that, but I, I remembering them all off the top of my head. Yeah, plenty of cleanup done. Yeah, that's awesome. This could have been an eight-hour talk. How's cleanup? I love it. <laughs> um, early in the presentation, Ed, you mentioned per device optimizations. Do you think there's enough commonality across SOCs for Red Hat to be able to give like standard set of guidance to SOC vendors to say, here's what you guys should do to optimize your part of the deal? Probably, but I don't think we've worked with enough vendors to know yet. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd say that when I get into my Jeep, I open the door and the computer comes up. So I don't. Have, I think they cheat a little bit. So I think you, you'll probably be cheating as well. Um, the uh, do you see that there'll be a different, you know, a Qualcomm based kernel and a different kernel for I don't know Texas Instruments or whatever vendor is making these? I don't think at this time right now. I don't think so. On there, I think we could do. Especially with the if, for the early boot stuff, having things built in, it's small enough that to get up in the early boot that we could have a common kernel with that, um, and then just have later on services that aren't critical for boot have all those as modules. Uh, but from what we've seen from all the different platforms we have right now, we've been able to keep a common kernel so far. Yeah, uh, and originally uh, last time I was involved in this when Qualcomm was starting up. Qualcomm was taking like 1.5 seconds before the kernel would even start. 
is that still the case? Were they able to optimize that down? Yes. So as the least technical person in this room, I'm going to ask the dumbest question. Uh, I just attended this other talk on Risk Five, um, and it had a really interesting point on um, how Western Digital converted their entire line of disk controllers to ri disk Risk Five, and uh, they shipped billions of devices. Is this something that's additive to the advances of you know, like Red Hat's focus on Risk? Risk five and rise, and how important it is, or is this entirely different as an endeavor? And also, I, I'll, I'll let you know that one of your colleagues uh, warned me that this might be a technical session. So thank you. Um, it, it depends on. So some of the boot work is op, is generic. So like with the init ram fs optimizations, for example, like that's going to be architecture agnostic. Um, the, we did a fair bit of ARM64 optimizations um, in the kernel because it's just that's the architecture that we're running on. Um, those aren't going to go, none of those right now are going to go over to risk 5 on that. Um, but the principles still, the principles of what we used and shown here kind of at a high level will apply for risk 5 So even if you have a different ARM64 board or risk 5 board, like there's still just certain principles of like, just don't don't take for granted of like, oh things are already optimized the best that they could be, um, you know like with with Android with ARM sixty four and all the other places it's used and I mean it's just it, Red Hat found a lot of stuff and improved a lot of stuff on there. Thank you, uh, Ed, Ed Brian and Eric. Thanks a lot. <laughs>